Hello and welcome to our survey of First World War, or as it was called at the time, the Great War, as part of our general study of the preconditions and origins of Nazi Germany. Today we're going to be talking about several different things. I'm splitting this up into multiple smaller videos. The overall theme is 1918, Defeat, Revolution, and New Beginnings. And we're going to dive into a few different items here. Um, these different presentations should be hopefully about 10 to 20 minutes apiece. And together we'll be able to go into a uh, hopefully a lot more detail and also provide some sort of basic narrative of how World War I ends and how the, the internal politics of Germany and revolution take place. All right, and with that, let us get to it. So here's the uh, the front cover of the official version of the Versailles Treaty, signed June 28, 1919. And the first thing we need to think of and remember is that uh, Versailles is not something which happens uh, at one moment. They sign the document and then it's uh, done. It's finished. There's nothing else to do. In fact, the aftermath of Versailles and the, the official movements that it sets in motion go on for uh, quite a long time. In fact, um, uh, the different commissions and, and plebiscites uh, working out the border of the new border of, of the new Poland and Germany um, go into 1919, 1920, 1921. Um, in fact, uh, there's a whole there's a whole course to be taken on the history of Central and Eastern Europe uh, in the early 20s, in fact. Um, so, but before we get here, let's let's backtrack a little bit. Let's backtrack to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk uh, from liberal treaty to military occupation. So this first short presentation is going to be mostly about uh, Brest-Litovsk. Okay, so a couple things to remember about this. Um, we have the Russian Revolution. It's actually a couple different revolutions. You have the February Revolution, which is the overthrow of the Tsar and the establishment of a social democracy. And then you have the October Revolution, which is uh, Lenin and his Bolsheviks, which overthrows the Social Democrat government um, and establishes a government based on the workers' Soviets or the workers' councils. Um, that's, of course, October, and uh, there is, uh, from that point on, one of the conditions of sort of, uh, of German support for Lenin uh, in getting him back, uh, well, first to Finland, and so then he can uh, infiltrate uh, through the, uh, uh, into uh, the St. Petersburg area. One of their conditions of uh, the Germans for helping him uh, get there uh, was that he will pull Russia from the war, and they begin to they begin to do this. Uh, actual negotiations begin in December, and by March third, there is a treaty that is signed, and this treaty is actually every bit as important as uh, as the Versailles Treaty. Um, some context here: um, one of the main uh, one of the main impetus. Uh, points of impetus behind this, uh, getting something done, well, there were several things, but one of them uh, was Germany and especially Austria's worsening economic situation. So you can see from this chart, which is uh, uh, put together from 1914-1918 online, um, I believe it's from their, um, I think it is, the, it's the actual uh, data um, which I pasted in here. Um, you can see from 1916 to early 1918, imports of grains, uh, cattle, meat, butter, uh, cheese, and fish all drastically drop off as you get from, uh, as we, we uh, uh, move into the decisive year. 
Um, you'll notice that July to November, some of these things begin to pick up again. So cattle, uh, grain uh, increases a bit. Um, cheese and fish uh, are really about the same. Uh, so, and this is uh, more specifically to Germany. Austria is in much more dire straits. Uh, they are running short of, uh, of not only uh, foodstuffs, but also um, heating material, uh, particularly for the winter. So they, the Austrians are anxious to get this negotiated and finished as soon as possible. Um, another way to look at this by, uh, by 1917, 1918, You'll notice that inflation in Germany is is not particularly good, but it's no nowhere near what it's going to be after the war is over. Um, the cost of foodstuffs by 1918 has about doubled. Um, cost of living index uh, is about tripled what it was in 1913. So, even though it looks like Germany is still quite strong, they are. German armies are still occupying foreign territory. It's not like um, the Reich itself is under direct threat. Um, but internally, their economy is grinding, is grinding down. This is a, a visual way of looking at this. Um, uh, France is having difficulties. Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Russia are having difficulties. Famine conditions are approaching in various areas uh, Romania for example which had just and Serbia which had been really beaten up pretty badly in the uh, um, in the uh, offensives particularly 1916-1917 so they sit down to the negotiating table and there are economic considerations behind this a number of these a number of the areas that they are negotiating with because it's not just the Russians there's also representatives from the different provinces, the aspiring, the provinces that aspire to independent nation status, uh, and particularly the Ukraine. And they have a lot of resources that Germany and Austria would very much like to, to lay their hands on and have, uh, have shipped to them if they can conclude this treaty fast enough. Um, we do have a fair number of photographs from this period, uh, this one, this is from, you, you can see here in the um, in the bottom right corner, it's the Imperial War Museum in London. So you have uh, German and Russian troops uh, meeting together, bartering, uh, uh, sharing drinks, and uh, kind of getting to know each other. You have uh, Trotsky here arriving, the German delegation. Leon Trotsky uh, is the one in charge of negotiations. So this is uh, sort of at the height of Trotsky's uh, uh, height of his position uh, within the Bolshevik Revolution at this point. Um, he's organizing the Red Army. He, uh, he dictates a lot. He has a lot of fiery speeches and, uh, and published writing. Um, he's sort of, in many ways, uh, the, very, the very public face uh, of, of the revolution. Um, and at this point, he's, of course, being given uh, major tasks. There's a tendency to see uh, Trotsky as, you know, one of the great leaders of the revolution. Of course, in point of fact, as the more recent scholarship has shown, uh, Stalin is is uh, uh, Lenin's right hand uh, at this point, <coughs> um, despite Trotsky uh, bestowing a whole bunch of you know, fanciful nicknames on, on Stalin and treating him with contempt. However, Trotsky's in the driving seat here for these negotiations. Um, his aim uh, was to draw out the negotiations, um, uh, sort of more or less for as long as possible. He 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 basically was being intransigent on purpose until finally the exasperated uh, German delegation uh, says, "Look, why are you being? This is ridiculous. We could just you know send the troops in and take whatever we want, but we're trying to conclude this peace on on you know on sort of Wilson you know, Wilson's terms." Because Wilson is already, Woodrow Wilson's already indicated um, the sort of peace and the sort of uh, behavior he expects from the German, uh, the German state as a sign of its of its good faith, and Trotsky says thank you for admitting that this is not a peace between equals. This is uh, an imposed imperialist peace, and you're simply pretending to be nice, but really what's behind this is the threat of military force. That's what I just wanted to establish that. 
Um, and so here's the, the front page of the treaty in, in five different languages. Trotsky actually turns away. He won't, he doesn't even look at the document when he signs it. Um, it's a, it's a quite a, it's quite a, quite a performance. Um, so we mentioned, I mentioned two things that were sort of German priorities going into this. Um, one, get access to the raw materials um, needed both for food, for the home front, for the war, for heating, especially if you're Austria, um, from these new newly independent states, particularly Ukraine. And of course, the second thing is end the war so they can transfer uh, troops to the West, uh, either for an offensive or to build up their defenses as more and more American troops are anticipated to be arriving shortly. Um, in the American uh, history of this, called The Great War, um, so Volume 5, 1921, they published this map um, showing the results of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And you'll notice up here it says self-determined areas, in quotes, self-determined. Um, because in 1921, they're saying, well, this was just really a pretense, the Germans being dishonest, militaristic um, tyrants, uh, who respect no one and nothing, uh, were simply using these terms in, a, in an empty pretense to show, to, to try to trick Woodrow Wilson to thinking they were acting in good faith, but they really weren't. So Estonia, Livonia, uh, Finland, uh, Ukraine, this is all just, this is all nonsense. They're not really free. They're going to be German puppet states. Um, and of course, there's this territory here, which they are, are supposed to be ceded directly to uh, Germany. Um, and then the Germans are going to be evacuating this area. Now, this is actually a, a distortion of what actually happened. And so what you'll often hear with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, in fact, uh, I remember um, teaching it this way. This is how we taught it even at West Point when I was teaching there, um, that the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, once it's concluded on March 3, 1918, is the first actual tangible demonstration to the Allies of what the world is going to look like if the Germans win. And we're going to see land appropriations. We're going to see puppet governments set up everywhere. We're going to see ruthless exploitation of, uh, of conquered peoples, natural, natural resources, and probably to some extent human resources as well. And that interpretation clearly does play. I mean, we see this in 1921, a couple of years later. This is how Brest-Litovsk is portrayed. The actual history of what happens at Brest-Litovsk is, is, somewhat, is somewhat different. Um, this is very much a, a, a liberal, a product of, of the, sort of the, the Reichstag and sort of the liberal elements in the Reichstag. The German negotiators are going there in good faith. As far as the German politicians and diplomats see it, they are doing exactly what they should do. Um, they they think you know self determination is a great thing. Uh, not for the poles in their in their own area, of course. But if they're they're going to try to solve the war on the Eastern Front, and they're going to try to do it along Wilsonian lines. If the Ukrainians want to be independent, then that should be respected. If the Finns want to be independent, then that should be respected. Um, as far as some of the other areas that the Germans are occupying, uh, they may fudge that a little bit. But as far as the German uh, German politicians are concerned, this is a triumph. It's uh, the treaty's taken back to the Reichstag. Uh, it's regarded uh, as a point as a cause of celebration. They have they have con concluded a just peace, and uh, they they refrain from from taking everything they wanted. They're they're trying to follow Wilson's. Um, Wilson's uh, strictures on how this is to they are to conduct themselves, and this should be a guarantee of good faith uh, going forward in negotiations uh, to end the war. Should those should those progress? Um, now, of course, the new republics are going to look to Germany because it doesn't matter who you put your money on with the Russian Revolution. Maybe the Social Democrats come back. Maybe the Bolsheviks win. Uh, there's sort of the gathering sort of white Russian counter-revolutionary activities. It doesn't matter. Whoever wins that is probably going to want their provinces back. Uh, it, it took, it took the, the Russian state uh, centuries uh, to, to acquire these different territories. 
Uh, and of course, Ukraine, uh, given its its extremely rich farmland, was regarded as a point of, of vital Russian interest and not something that Russia is going to surrender lightly, whoever's in charge. And in fact, we see a lot of shades of this going up into, into 2014. Uh, repeated with, with Putin and the Crimea and the Donbass War um, and uh, the overtures to, to, join, to join NATO or the European Union, um, sort of really spooking the Russians, saying, well, no, Ukraine has, has historically been within our, 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 uh, our, our interests, our, our, our circle, uh, sphere of interest. So, of course, these states are, new states are going to look to Germany and so it in, might be enlightened self-interest, but they do also want to be independent of Russia. Uh, so that's what the Reichstag is thinking. Um, where things begin to go wrong and why this map with the self-determined uh, phrase in quotes becomes a reality is because the military gets uh, impatient and um, the German military actually overthrows the democratically elected government of Ukraine um, uh, and as of April 30th, 1918, they installed their own um, puppet uh, regime in the Ukraine so they can begin to speed up the process of extracting primarily war materials. Um, so in that case, it looks like the worst kind of, of German behavior. Uh, treaties are a piece of paper. The Germans will sign and say anything they want to get you to agree to whatever they want, and then they'll just come in and take whatever they want, and um, they will act like murderous tyrants. So Brussels Tosk is undone very much by the military. Now, the independent um, Republic of Ukraine doesn't really have long to, to last anyway. Um, it's As you can see, you have a, a what's – this is a bit – uh, it's not Soviet Russia. Well, I guess it is Soviet Russia at this point because the Soviets are the, the sort of the the basis of that revol that particular version of the revolution. Um, you have the Donbass region. You have heavy uh, Red Army presence uh, here. You have um, a, a, a new Poland, which wants chunks of what... Uh, uh, of what Ukraine has. And um, you can see that by 19, March 1919, so about a year after the treaty, uh, the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, this is all that's left of Ukraine. The rest has been occupied by, by the Bolshevik armies. Uh, Poland has, uh, uh, has its own uh, ambitions as well. Now, Poland and Russia are going to fight each other uh, very shortly anyway. So Brestletosk sort of sets in motion or sort of identifies clearly some of the major national, uh, national interests and aspirations and sort of competing claims uh, for independence, sovereignty, and legitimacy that are going to be major players in Eastern Europe, at least through the Second World War. And uh, we're, we're, sort of, we're going to see some of these even coming back now in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, so, this is it's an interesting treaty. Uh, it it doesn't end the way it started out. It becomes uh, an embarrassment to uh, the Reich the Reichstag. It becomes an embarrassment to the German Foreign Office. Uh, and it uh, after all this sort of attention, which you can see with with charts like this, where um, people are being told, "Look, Ukraine has all this wonderful stuff," you know, and look we. Um, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna work here and we're gonna try to get, uh, 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 we're, we're working to create this, uh, this new, this new state and we're, we're being, you know, just and liberal and generous and, uh, all of that kind of, uh, collapses very quickly. All right. So that's, um, that's kind of brest And of course this is unfolding. Uh, in the rest of the narrative of 1918, and that's going to be our our next presentation. How do we go from from Brest Litovsk on March 3rd, 1918? Things are looking pretty good at this point. To Germany suing for terms and getting an armistice in November, and that's where we're going uh, to go next. All right, so I will see you then on the next video.